Hello everyone, I'm Santiago C. Carrada, President and CEO of Visit Tampa Bay, and welcome to another edition of Unlocking Tampa Bay. It's June and summer is just around the corner. We have so much to talk about in this episode, but first, let's recap a little bit and talk about all the great things that happened in May. In May, we celebrated National Travel and Tourism Week. We also celebrated our amazing Tampa River Walk at Riverfest. We welcome new Tampa Bay additions to the Michelin Guide to Florida, like Somi, Noble Rice, and Lilac at the Tampa edition. We also welcome Big John, the largest, most complete Triceratops skeleton ever discovered, which is now on display at the Glazer Children's Museum. The annual Sunset Music Festival took place at Raymond James Stadium, generating a huge economic impact over the two-day festival. And of course, also celebrated Mother's Day and all the moms out there with events and activations all over Hillsborough County. But now we're in June and there's even more to look forward to. The Broadway favorite Annie comes to the Strath Center for the Performing Arts. Summer Nights returns to Busch Gardens Tampa Bay for late night thrills and cultural festivals and celebrations that include the Tampa Bay Area Juneteenth Festival taking place at Raymond James Stadium and the Tampa Theater's annual Juneteenth event featuring an incredible silent film from the 1920s and so much more. There's always something to look forward to and celebrate in Tampa Bay. From the oldest restaurant in the state of Florida to our newest five-star hotel, we're talking about the culinary evolution taking place in Tampa Bay and where we go from here. Take it away, Serena. Continuing the conversation on unlocking Tampa Bay and uncovering hidden treasures, what's not better than food? And let's talk Michelin. It's all about Michelin. Who better to talk about it than Jeff Hawk, the vice president of marketing for the 1905 Family Group. Thank you for inviting me. Oh my gosh, it's our pleasure to have you here. So Jeff, 1905 Family Group, Yes. tell us about it. Well, it is what the name implies. It is uh, a family of restaurants owned by the Gonsmart family since 1905. It started as the Saloon Columbia in 1903 and now includes all of the Columbia uh, restaurant locations across Florida and Columbia Cafe, as well as Yuleli, Goody Goody, San Casa Santo Stefano, and Cha Cha Coconuts, and we have an airport concept called Cafe Con Leche Ibo City. So, you know, 14 locations, mm -hmm. six brands, all kinds of good yumminess, um, and you know. It's and five generations, right? Five, five, generations, five generations continuing to bring owned. all this yep. great food to Tampa. Always family owned. So um, we have to point out, your voice. You are a, a journalist before you were this. I know you were a writer. Are not supposed to have voices? Okay. <laughs> no, okay. I love your voice. You have such you. a You have such a great voice. Why, thank you. You are a writer. I am. You are a writer, but you have a radio television voice also. Uh, thank you. Know. you. Yes. So I guess that's a compliment. It is a huge compliment. Okay, it's a huge compliment. But you were brought in um, to the 1905 mm -hmm. family, family group, yeah. as, but with, you know, with such a strong journalist background. And yeah. we're talking about Michelin. Talk about your restaurants and how the restaurants in your group have been affected by the Michelin Guide, but how significant it is for the Tampa community. I, I can't overstate the, the significance of Michelin in Tampa Bay. Uh, it is the moment that Tampa's restaurants have been waiting for for many generations to be nationally recognized and internationally recognized because Michelin is an international brand. Um, you know, our restaurants, Columbia Restaurant, and also Yuleli were uh, recognized as uh, recommended restaurants. And we're really not the kind of tweezer and chopstick and um, you know, uh, intense, mm -hmm. high-end experience kind of restaurants. We're, we're very much about quality and freshness and telling the story of Tampa through food. Um, and those don't always get recognized. So for us to have any kind of Michelin recognition was a tremendous uh, honor. And then for us to stay on it for the second round of announcements has been even more reinforcement for that. And what we found is that people were coming to Tampa and they're discovering all the wonderful things that we have here. And mm -hmm. then food is becoming the new souvenir. If they don't go to the Tampa restaurants, they haven't really visited Tampa. And as you know, Tampa um, lives through its food. It has its own food culture and its own food history. And some of that happens at our restaurants, like the mm -hmm. Columbia and Yaleli. Mm -hmm. When Yaleli tells the native food story, Goody Goody tells the, the diner story of Tampa. And Casa Santo Stefano is the Sicilian immigrants coming to Ybor City and their food and how it adapted. 
Um, but everybody gets a little piece of that that Michelin energy, and it's um, it's nice to get recognized in a way that hasn't happened before. And everybody, you're right. Everybody, whether you're a Michelin restaurant or mm -hmm. not, can really see the benefits mm -hmm. of something like this because people travel all over just to visit right. the Michelin restaurants. You know, like in, some people travel to see their favorite sports teams or right. some people travel to see their favorite city, but they will go to a city simply because it's it has Michelin rated. Well, think about when you travel. If you mm -hmm. go to say Las Vegas, well, where did you eat? Did you go to New Orleans? Well, where did you eat? That's becoming the Tampa standard now. Did you eat at X? Um, where did you eat? What did you have? Did you have a Cuban sandwich? Um, and that's a tremendous thing because that's that means that beyond the the beaches or beyond the theaters or any of the zoos or attractions that we have, people are engaging in an emotional way. Food's an emotional souvenir for people and they they take it into their bodies and they have this experience and that's why people take pictures of their food i was there this is what i had <laughs> you didn't have this mm -hmm. um, isn't this unique and beautiful and it was so delicious um, that's an important thing to show off and tampa has it in abundance and it always has you know you as your background as a food writer mm -hmm. tell us about the significance of how many Michelin star rated restaurants we have right now. We have, and it goes beyond that. There's mm -hmm. mentions. Can you just break it down, break so it down for it's, us? It's, uh, you know, there's multi levels. And, you know, uh, everybody aims for the Michelin stars because that's the thing that has been the standard, especially in Europe, uh, for many, many years. You know, it originally was a guide for people as the automobile was becoming more common. Where do you travel in your automobile on the road? Here's a road guide. Isn't that something how that came about it with is. the tire? Very smart. <laughs> I know. Marketing. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? And guess what? If you if you drive a lot and you use up your tires, you buy more tires. How about going to this restaurant to do it? Well, you, you know? know, it was crazy because when I first saw it, right. you know, and I first saw the, and I thought, there's no way this the food and the tires. What are you talking about? Yeah. But it, brilliant. It is brilliant, and and so, you know, the the standard is: Are you worth the travel? I mean, the underlying theme there is, is it worth the trip? And, you know, it's evolved over the years, but especially in Europe, the Michelin star is the, is the gold medal. Um, you know, in America, we have the James Beard Foundation Awards. And, you know, those have their own prestige. And having Michelin as an international award, and Tampa, as you know, has so many international uh, visitors, and Florida does, that it, it hits a different vibe as a result. Um, so you have stars, and then there are bibs, which are sort of not not below, but it's just a, a one level difference. Mm -hmm. And then the recommended restaurants, and there's more of the recommended restaurants than there are stars. We have three starred restaurants um, that were just announced recently, uh, with Roca and Lilac at the Edition Hotel, and also Koya, which is a, um, an omakasa Japanese restaurant. And you know those three really, I think, have have set the benchmark for others. There are lots of others that are worthy of stars here. It's just a matter of time for the Michelin reviewers to find them and to visit them and then to revisit them because they're very rigorous about how they judge. Uh -huh. It's not an arbitrary thing. You can't buy your way into getting a star or a recommendation or a bib. Um, you know, they are earned and, um, and there's many more here and I can't wait for them to be found because it's just, it's, it's what people living here have always known um, just being recognized by third parties. And it's wonderful to see it. it and is. as you and I were talking about, I mean, modesty aside here, but Tampa, right. look at Tampa on fire. Santiago Carrada, the CEO, visit Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's so humble. The team is so humble. But what you and I shared prior to coming on the right. air, please share that story on This Is Magic. It is magic. And, you know, the, the team at Visit Tampa Bay, I think, wisely uh, chose food as a tent pole for how you experience Tampa. And they were the first that I know of that created their own cookbook to mm -hmm. showcase all of the variety of food that was here. I have many of them. Yeah. <laughs> then they did a cocktail <laughs> book. You know, they've, they've showcased the, the beer scene that's here, the craft beer scene that really kind of exploded based in Tampa in the, uh, the mid 2000s, late 2000s, and spread all the way up I-4 up to Jacksonville. There's a brew belt that happened. Um, it happened here, but it was also, you know, harnessed by Visit Tampa Bay. And they understood that eating is 
um, a crucial part of the visitor experience. And if you come here and you don't eat, you've only really experienced half of it. Um, so they, they saw that very early on. But the other thing I want to say is that what's happening in Tampa now is not new. The reason that people mm -hmm. started coming to Tampa back in the early 1900s, beyond the cigar factories and everything, was once it was established, Tampa got known nationally for its Latin Quarter and all the restaurants in Ybor. So restaurants were the first draw beyond the hotels, beyond the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Tampa Bay Hotel. Um, they became known first for food. It's always been a, a magnet for people. So, you know, there were breweries downtown back in the 30s and 40s. You know, there, there's been bakeries and mayonnaise plants and, and, you know, all kinds of different food industries that have been here for generations since the early 1900s, late 1800s. That's why the Cuban sandwich is so much in our DNA. And I'm so glad you mentioned the Cuban sandwich because uh. clearly you love the Cuban sandwich so much. Yeah. You wrote a book about the Cuban sandwich. I joined with... Uh, uh, the Cuban sandwich, a history in layers. Yeah, we came out with this late last year to talk about the history of the sandwich and what and how it developed You know, with Andy Hughes and Barbara Cruz and I. And the history of the Cuban sandwich is the history of Tampa and the, the reflection of all the people who moved here and brought their food with them. And there's more complexity than you would ever expect, far more than ever I expected. Um, but there are practitioners to this day who are making everything except the bread and the Swiss cheese. You know, there's a, there's mm -hmm. a butcher in, in Tampa who even makes his own salami. I mean, wow. that's, that to me is hardcore respect for the food history and the, and the legacy that we have here. And circling back mm -hmm. then to the 1905 yeah. family group, I mean, thus the Cuban sandwich. Well, we you know that at the Columbia, and it's in the book, is uh, the story about how, you know, the sandwich that we serve every day is the same recipe from at least 1915. We know it's earlier than that, but that's the first printed version that we have. And in the book, I read about how, you know, fourth generation caretaker Richard Gonsmart realized that there would have been so many shortcuts over the generations that he needed to go back and reinvent and rediscover what the essence of it was. And everybody said, oh, you're crazy. It's going to cost too much. And at the end of it, it only cost eight cents more to do it the right way. Eight cents? And he's like, what are we talking about? So, you know, there's all kinds of great stories within the Cuban sandwich. It's not just about the ingredients, although that's a great story. It's sort of what happens. Like, for instance, there's a, a place in Seoul, South Korea that makes their um, Cuban sandwiches. I found them, and they make their Cuban sandwiches with kimchi. Oh. And essentially, you know, you can say, oh, that's really weird. But if you look at the mustard and you uh -huh. look at the pickles, uh -huh. it kind of makes sense. But the whole thing is, is that their name, the name of their restaurant is called Tampa Sandwich Bar. And that was significant to me because everybody does Miami, everybody does this and that. Uh -huh. But to have someone that would name their, their restaurant after Tampa tells me how powerful our food legacy is. And by mentioning that, mm -hmm. of course, I mean, we are Visit Tampa Bay. Absolutely. It is going to be drawing more and more people in, as you even said, for generations to come. Absolutely. Well, okay, Jeff, as we wrap up, this is going to be very difficult. If you had to describe oh, you're the this. culinary food scene in just one word, what would it be? I'll ask you that question. I know. Shoot. Forever the journalist, always bringing it back. Exactly. Well, I, I mean... The first word comes to my mind, and it's not even that special, but is it's spectacular. That's a good one. I like that. Uh, to me, um, it just tastes like home. It's oh. it's very very um, very <laughs> warm and inviting. It's not you don't have to uh, you don't have to work very hard to enjoy the flavors that are here. You can go high end, you can go low end, but no matter what you choose. It feels like somebody with human hands touched your food and loved it enough to make it the way that they did. Um, it feels like home to me, and it always will. You, too, are certainly a treasure. Thank you. Tampa Bay. Thank you so much for joining us on Thank the show. Thank you for inviting me. And now, what a treat. Continuing our conversation with culinary trailblazer, Michelin star chef John Fraser. Chef, flying in from New York, welcome to Unlocking Tampa Bay. Thank you. I'm a little starstruck. So I need to calm down a little. <laughs> so thank you so much again for being here. Please. Michelin star, tell us about you and your work with the addition. So uh, we been, began our work a couple of years ago. Um, we have three restaurants, uh, Azure, which is on the roof, uh, Market, which is our three meal a day, Italian Trattoria, and Lilac, which is our fine dining. And okay, 
The restaurants are amazing and beautiful, Thank and we're you. gonna get back to that in a moment. But tell us about you. You got the bug to cook, right? In college. In college, yeah. Share that journey with us. Sure. Um, I found myself after class getting more excited about the work that I was doing and the kind of tribe that was existing in restaurants more so than I was finding myself excited about school. So after college, I started cooking. Um, I was cooking and, and bartending all the way through college and started professionally uh, after college. And it's, the story is so sweet, though. It goes back to your family, sure. um, your beautiful mom, Liza. Yeah. Mm -hmm your sister Jen, yep. and your dad, John. John. Yep. So you lived in, um, and you have said, come from very humble beginnings. Yeah. Talk to me about that and family dinner and yeah. what you would do and how that inspired yeah. you. Yeah. So my folks um, cooked every day. Not that it was always great, but it, was, <laughs> it happened. <laughs> but um, the family gathered around the table um, every night. And I think that the kind of ceremony of gathering um, led me towards restaurants, not really had knowing yet what a fine dining restaurant was, or frankly, we only would go out once a year or twice a year if we got good grades. Um, so uh, I actually didn't go to a fine dining restaurant until I was cooking in them. Uh, so I think it was more sort of a cultural uh, sort of thing that was happening in restaurants for me, how I felt when I was working in restaurants, the people I was surrounded by, different cultures, you know, from... In, in California at the time, Latinos and all different kinds of, of, of people that I was surrounded by. I was super excited by that. Um, but also this idea that we were serving people around a table and people celebrating, gathering inside the restaurants. What is it, do you feel, about taking that family experience and food, right? Memories are, are so associated yeah. with what we eat. Yeah, and what we drink. And what we drink, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I just think that, you know, when you spend time with people and you have 15 or 20 minutes, it's not quite enough. And after an hour is when you really start to get into it and the settling happens. Um, and if you just sprinkle in a little bit of uh, wine and, and good mm -hmm. food and things, you know, you start to create memories. And, and in a way, people go back to good memories. So in, in our restaurants, we always try and say that. We try and create a moment for people that hopefully they'll come back to. And I want people to remember this when you said the first time that you actually went to a fine dining restaurant was when you worked in a fine dining yeah, that's restaurant. Right. That's right. So with your parents, and mm -hmm. I'm just staying on the story with your parents because yeah. so much love in your family mm -hmm. that you felt you could pursue any dream no matter what. Yeah. I mean, I was a pre-med student and an anthropology student in college. Um, and after school, I... I I was sort of like, I, I'm really interested in this thing called cooking. And they were like, yeah, go. And, and that kind of energy is kind of carried forth. And when I found myself in very risky moments of like, well, I could lose it all or, or I could gain it all. Um, you know, the idea that my folks were, the love of my folks was sort of the, the foundation um, allowed me to take those risks because I knew I could always go back to them and sleep on their couch if I had. They must be, I can't even imagine. I mean, everybody's so proud of you, but I can only imagine how proud your family is. I, I you. would imagine so, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I haven't asked them for money in 40 years, so I, <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so speaking of family and cooking, mm -hmm. the vegetables, yep. I mean, you were so known in your restaurants for the vegetables. When did that, when did that start? Did that start from early on? Yeah, so my folks had a, a garden and we were always involved and, and, you know, we have an avocado tree in our backyard. It was just uh, part of our, the way that we ate um, as kids. And, um, as I was kind of going through the process, going from kind of sous chef to chef to, to owner of restaurant, I was watching the art industry move towards more of a kind of piggy moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know, there would be an opportunity to maybe be a contrarian um, and start a veggie moment. And what ended up happening was I was watching my guests, the profile of my guests, and they're completely different than people that I was normally serving. Um, so you know, it kind of makes environmental sense and it starts to make commercial sense. And you're like, well, this is a good idea. Because you had a special day, right? Yeah, one meatless of your Mondays, yeah. Meatless Mondays. Yeah. So I called you a trailblazer at the very beginning as I introduced you. No, you are. So this, I mean, right now, everything I think is about vegetables and a healthier life. But you just had that instinct from so long ago. I think also, you know, at the time, you know, people talking about vegetables, they were raving, ra ra you know, sort of waving a flag around uh, fur and other things. And mm -hmm. I was more, if we can make it delicious, people will, will, will gravitate towards it. Um, hopefully that's more the message. It's not an activist message. It's more a kind of oppor an opportunity or an option message. 
So what are your favorite vegetables? It depends on the season. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'd love now to hear. Now is asparagus. Now is asparagus. Yeah, now is asparagus. Um, America um, produces incredible vegetables. You know, we, uh, I think that we import a lot of vegetables because it become cheaper, but um, we're a huge fan of supporting our local farmers if we can. Um, the asparagus season in the Northeast and, and actually the, the, the corridor here, um, it's quite short. It's only like a month or six wow, weeks. Wow, really? Um, and then it starts to widen out into Mexico and Peru and, and across our borders. Still good asparagus, but mm-hmm. I'd like to try and keep it, mm-hmm. keep it local as much as possible. Um, and then we head into tomato season, which is tomato and asparagus mm. are my two favorites, I think. Um, you heard it here. Yeah. Tomatoes and asparagus, get your yeah. favorites. Yeah, two favorites. Um, and then I think, you know, I love root vegetables, it's mm-hmm. like turnips and kind of odd, oddball, oddball kind of stuff. Um, and mostly because I like them personally, but also I like to try and get them into people's faces and, and make them surprised by, you know, the idea of a turnip or a rutabaga, things that we kind of Brussels sprouts mm-hmm. grew up hating as kids. Uh, <laughs> if we can try and turn it around as an adult, I think there's always a nice aha moment. Right. And right now with. Brussels sprouts. Who in the world thought people would love yeah. Brussels sprouts? Well, mostly so because we're, people were screwing them up, <laughs> right? It's easy to hate when they're screwed up. Absolutely. You're right. You're right. Yeah. So speaking of local, and you've talked about yeah. local, mm-hmm. right now you have restaurants in New York, mm-hmm. Chicago, of course, Tan- Not Chicago. I'm, I'm sorry, California. Yep. I went to college in Chicago, so Got that's it. why I'm always like, you know, maybe someday. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're some, seeing the future. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yes. Let's put it out in the universe yeah, yeah, right now. Yeah, let's put yeah, it out on yeah. the We'd universe love to go right to now. Um, um, and also, Boston in the future. Boston in the future. Mm-hmm. But coming back to Tampa, and mm-hmm. we were talking about local. Tell us about the restaurants here and how you really use our local themes infused into your menus. Yeah. So. We call it trying to cook in context. Um, so that means that we're not kind of just taking recipes from our restaurant in New York and bringing it down to Tampa. Um, we tried to get a real sense of how people eat here, what they like, what are kind of the culinary traditions of a, of a place, put a study on that, mm-hmm. and then apply that to the creativity. Um, so it doesn't feel like it was kind of landed from outer space, but it was grown here. I love that you, you said that. It's not that you're taking the, the menus from, you know, the other cities. Yeah. You're working with what we have here. It's original to here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we take a lot of pride in that. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of recipes floating around. So um, keeping track of it is not always the easiest. But, um, you know, hopefully we feel like people feel like it's for them. And it's not just kind of copy paste job. You know, the Tampa palette is quite interesting. Um, it's a robust palette. So, you know, the way that we cook in Los Angeles, for instance, mm-hmm. we use a lot of nuance. There's a lot more of kind of quiet flavors. And in Tampa, it's very bold. So we're using a lot of fat, a lot of salt, a lot of mm-hmm. spice um, to try and break through. And, and, you know, you can't know that unless you've been around here and you've eaten at the restaurants and you talk to people about what they like and what they don't. Um, I think that when we started, we were a bit too nuanced and we've since turned up the volume slightly. You know, that's just so much about you to also say that, hey, we started one way um, and well, we, we always start screwing up. That's, <laughs> that's part, of the, part of the process, right? Is that part of the fun too? Just trying to figure Screw up out. isn't that fun, but yeah, yeah, it is part of the process for sure. Yeah. So when did you first start thinking, gosh, you know, Tampa, I want to be in Tampa. Um, my fir- and, and they my, wanted you. Yeah. My first trip here. Um, I just, I saw like a ton of sophistication. I saw a ton of young people that were being underserved. Um, and I think that was three years ago, maybe it, I, sorry, COVID brain, but mm-hmm. it was a while ago now. Um, and, and, um, listen, it's a fantastic property. We, we work with the addition deeply. We're great partners. Um, they support us. And, and then I met the ownership group and they were like, we want to do something, you know, best of, and, you know, we put our hat in the ring. Well, clearly you're very tenacious. When you first started your company, um, started to build a company, mm-hmm. 500 people yeah. during COVID, you said it went down to four, yeah. never gave up. Yeah. You've always, um, you have been known as a chef that has such a hard work ethic mm. and very, very modest, <laughs> but Michelin starred I mean, and multiple Michelins. Tell us modesty aside, truly what that means. You know, it validates the hard work. Um, that's one thing. It validates the pedigree and the team that we put together. Um, so much of our success is based on from top to bottom, those hundreds of people. Um, and also trust and teaching and coaching and being present. Um, which I think is probably the hardest part of this is that, um, you know, we need to be present for our guests, present for our partners, present for our team members. 
Um, and as we get stretched thinner and thinner, it's harder to be present. Um, so putting our, our sort of energy towards a common goal and creating that and having the courage to say we want to do something that hasn't been done before, um, that's kind of part of it. Um, you know, stars are great. They can be taken away as well, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of, in a way, it's like there's a sort of a risk game that's being played. The trophy case has stars inside of it, but I don't think that necessarily dictates what and how we work. Um, if it did, then the star ever gets taken away, then it's a failure. Um, so I think we're careful to not put all of our energy behind the star, but to say that we deserve it because we, we worked, worked really for hard it. for it. You've yeah. worked really hard for yeah. it. So we are unlocking Tampa Bay. We are visit Tampa Bay. Mm-hmm. Michelin starred restaurants. I mean, I always feel people travel to that city specifically right. for the restaurants. And you've, can you, I'm sure you have been at many restaurants where people have come in and they have said, oh my gosh, we came here just to try yeah. your restaurant. Can you share some of those stories with yeah. us? Yeah. And, and I want to add on that. The other thing that Michelin does when it comes to a city is it attracts talent. So if, you know, let's just use myself as an example. If I'm coming, I worked in Paris for a couple mm-hmm. of years. If I'm coming back to the States and I want to express my kind of fine dining muscles, I'll only go to places where I believe I can be successful. So Michelin coming mm-hmm. to Tampa, hopefully will bring culinary talent and, and um, sommelier talent back to the city that perhaps that they're from or a city they're curious about because they, can, they know they can actually express their pedigree. Um, so I, I think that it's kind of two ways. It's not just about guests. It's also about talent coming mm-hmm. to a city. So I think that what you'll see in the next call five years, a lot of homegrown talent will come to pass and, and Michelin will be able to recognize those folks as well. Fascinating. Yeah. So you see more and more because of what you have established. Well, what, Your Michelin, team, what, what, Michel- team, what, what Michelin, Michelin established. What Michelin means to um, cooks and, and, and restaurant people, um, it validates all of their hard work and, and it makes them want to kind of bring it to their city um, as opposed to only going to like the five or six cities that existed prior. So mm-hmm. it's, it's exciting on both sides and you'll see kind of like a bubbling up of talent and you'll see folks that'll start to get a little bit more ambitious. You'll see people investing in restaurants in a different way because they're going for kind of a different um, adoration. It just yeah. has, it has a domino effect. It, yeah. I mean, it helps everybody. It's great, for, it's great for the city. It's really great. So speaking of cities, yeah. I know you are going, you know, city to city to city. What, what are some of your favorites about Tampa? I mean, the weather. I, lo- <laughs> I love the weather here. Uh, lack of smoke. <laughs> yeah. I have um, to agree with you there. Yeah, I, I, like the, I like the people here a lot. Yeah, I mean, when, when you land from New York, there's a sort of like calmness and familiarity. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's really great. Um, I also like seeing growth stories. I think that's kind of the best of it is that in my short time here, I've watched it go from kind of like, should we, can we, to we are. Yeah. I think that's exciting. I'm emotional about it too, because I moved here 20 years ago. Yeah, you should be. It's so, it's amazing. Yeah. So if people go into one of your restaurants, is there a certain food that you think that they should order? So name the baby. That's what you're saying. Name yeah. the baby. <laughs> yeah. Name the baby. Yeah. Um, so on the roof, I love the dips and the mm-hmm. meze. Um, that's how I like to eat. It's mm-hmm. kind of grabbing towards the middle of the table. Um, in Market, which is our, our um, Italian uh, restaurant, uh, the pizza, I think it is really mm-hmm. good. Our dough has a little bit of sourdough in it. So you'll find like a little yeah. bit of edge of, of, um, of kind of sour. It's mm-hmm. great. Um, or acid. Um, in Lilac, I mean, we're, we're constantly evolving that menu. But I think the best moment of the, of the, of the meal really um, maybe two, um, are the hors d'oeuvres. So when it, when you first sit, you yes. just kind of get hit with a bunch of small plates and you kind of eat with your hands and you just get sort of like calm down and sit into it. But I also think the pastry program is pretty incredible. Caroline's our, our, our executive pastry chef and she's done really an incredible work and we do a lot of kind of savory, sweet, a couple of little surprises there. I think I'm excited by that as well. So have your, has your family come in? Uh, my sister's coming tomorrow, actually. Fantastic. My folks not yet. Oh, what a treat that yeah. will be for them. Yeah. Chef, is there anything that, um, oh, I do want to say something. You yeah. know, there's been a lot of talk about you having your own show. And you have said, I don't want my own show. We appreciate so much for you then to be on our show. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> and you. to be able to do this wonderful conversation with you. Is there anything that you would like to add that I didn't ask you? Oh, that's very nice of you. Um, I think, you know, not enough kind of shine goes on to the team when you get a Michelin star, someone has to represent that star and I'm happy to do it. But you know, there's hundreds of people that are behind me that work tirelessly for that goal. Um, so putting some shine on them, recognizing that their hard work 
um, kind of led to that final. See what I mean, guys? Class act. So modest. Chef John Fraser, what an honor Thank you. to have you here on Unlocking Tampa Bay. And to learn more about the restaurants and all the amazing things happening here in Tampa, please just visit us at visittampabay.com. Until next time, everyone, stay safe.